Hello everyone, now let us discuss the anatomy of eyeball. The adult eyeball measures about 2.5 cm, that is 1 inch in diameter. Of its total surface area, only the anterior 1 6th portion is exposed. The remainder is recessed and protected by the orbit into which it fits. The eyeball is mainly composed of fibrous tunic, vascular tunic and retina. Coming to fibrous tunic, the fibrous tunic is the superficial layer of the eyeball and consists of anterior cornea and posterior sclera. Coming to cornea, cornea is a transparent coat that covers the colored iris. Cornea is a transparent coat that covers the colored iris. Because it is curved, the cornea helps focus light onto the retina. Its outer surface consists of non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and the middle coat of the cornea consists of collagen fibers and fibroblast and the inner surface is simple squamous epithelium. And since the central part of the cornea receives oxygen from outside air, contact lengths that are worn for long periods of time must be permeable to permit oxygen to pass through them. This is an important point. The central part of the cornea receives oxygen from the outside air. For that reason, the contact lens that are worn for long periods of time must be permissible to permit, permeable to permit oxygen to pass through them. Now, coming to the sclera. Sclera is white of the eye, is a layer of dense connective tissue made mostly of collagen fibers and fibroblasts. And the sclera, it covers the entire eyeball except the cornea and it gives shape to the eyeball, makes it more rigid, protects its inner parts and serves as a site of attachment for the extrinsic eye muscles. And at the junction of sclera and cornea is an opening known as scleral venous sinus. And a fluid called aqueous humor, it drains into the sinus. It will be discussed later. Aqueous humor drains into the sinus called scleral venous sinus. Good. Now coming to vascular tunic. The vascular tunic or uvea. Vascular tunic or uvea is the middle layer of the eyeball. It is composed of three parts. Choroid, ciliary body and iris. The highly vascularized choroid which is the posterior portion of the vascular tunic lines most of the internal surface of the sclera. Its numerous blood vessels provide nutrients to the posterior surface of the retina. The choroid also contains melanocytes that produce the pigment melanin which causes this layer to appear dark brown in color. Choroid contains melanocytes that produce the pigment melanin which causes this layer to appear dark brown in color. Melanin in the choroid absorbs stray rays which prevent reflection and scattering of lines within the eyeball. As a result, the image cast on the retina by the cornea and lens remains sharp and clear. And albinos, they lack melanin in all parts of the body, including the eye. They often need to wear sunglasses even indoors because even moderately bright light is perceived as bright, uh, bright glare due to the light scattering. And in the anterior portion of the vascular tunic, the choroid becomes the ciliary body. The, in the anterior portion of the vascular tunic, the choroid becomes the ciliary body. And it extends from the aura serrata, the jagged anterior margin of the retina, to a point just posterior to the junction of the sclera and cornea. At the end of this session, you will have an image. When you see the image and see the points, then you will understand clearly. As of now, the anterior portion of the vascular tunic, the choroid becomes ciliary body. And it extends from the ciliary body extends from aura serrata, the jagged anterior margin of the retina, to a point just posterior to the junction of sclera and cornea. And like the choroid, the ciliary body 
also appears dark brown in color because it contains melanin producing melanocytes the choroid contains melanocytes and the ciliary body also contains melanin producing melanocytes in addition the ciliary body consists of ciliary processes and ciliary muscle the ciliary processes are protrusions or folds on the internal surface of the ciliary body they contain blood capillaries that secrete the aquosuma extending from the ciliary processes are zonular fibers suspensory ligaments that attach to the lens and the fibers consist of thin halo fibrils that resemble elastic connective tissue fibers the next is ciliary muscle it is a circular band of smooth muscle ciliary muscle is a circular band of smooth muscle the function of ciliary muscle is the contraction or relaxation of the ciliary muscle changes the tightness of the zonular fibers which alter the shape of the lens adapting it for near or far vision and the iris the colored portion of the eyeball is in the shape of a flattened donut it is suspended between the cornea and the lens and is attached at its outer margin to the ciliary processes iris also contains melanocytes and circular and radiant smooth radial smooth muscle fibers the amount of melanin this is an important point the amount of melanin in the iris determines the eye color eyes appear brown to black when the iris contains large amounts of melanin blue when the melanin concentration is very low and green when its melanin concentration is moderate this iris melanin content in the iris determines the eye color and the principal function of iris is to regulate the amount of light entering the eyeball through the pupil the hole in the center of the iris pupil is nothing but the hole in the center of the iris the pupil meaning is little person because this is where you see a reflection of yourself when you look into someone's eyes hence the name pupil the principal function of iris is to regulate the amount of light entering the eyeball through the pupil the pupil appears black because as you look through the lens you see the heavily pigmented back of the eye that is choroid and retina for that reason the pupil appears black however if bright light is directed into pupil the reflected light is red because of the blood vessels of the surface of the retina if you direct a bright light into the pupil the reflected light is red because of the blood vessels in the surface of the retina it is for this reason a person's eyes appears red in the photograph when the flash is directed on to the pupil and autonomic reflexes regulate the pupil diameter in response to light levels autonomic autonomic reflexes regulate the pupil diameter in response to light levels when bright light stimulates the eye parasympathetic fibers when the bright light stimulates the eye parasympathetic fibers of oculomotor nerve stimulate the circular muscles or splinter pupillae of the iris to contract causing decrease in the size of the pupil whenever bright light stimulates this leads to contraction of iris in the pupil decrease thus decreasing the size of the pupil that is constriction and in dim light the sympathetic neurons stimulate the radial muscle or dilator pupillae bright light it stimulates parasympathetic fibers and dim light stimulates sympathetic fiber neurons they stimulate the radial muscles or dilated pupillae of the iris to contract causing an increase in the pupil size that is dilation in simple terms bright light contracts the pupil decreases the size of the pupil whereas dim light it dilates the size of the pupil here you can see 
the schematic representation of changes in the diameter of the pupil. The pupil constricts as circular muscles of iris contract. This is due to parasympathetic nervous system. Bright light, it constricts the circular muscles of the iris to contract. Thus, thus the size of the pupil is reduced. This is the size of the pupil in normal light. Whereas the dim light, the pupil dilates as the radial muscles of iris contract. This is due to parasympathetic effect. Dim light, the pupil dilates, whereas in the bright light, the pupil constricts. It is due to circular muscles of iris and this is due to radial contraction of radial muscles of iris. The contraction of circular muscles causes constriction of pupil and contraction of radial muscles causes dilation of pupil. Now coming to retina. The third and inner layer of the eyeball is the retina that lies posterior three quarters of the eyeball and is beginning of the visual pathway. Retina is the beginning of the visual pathway. This layer's anatomy can be viewed with an ophthalmoscope. An instrument that shines light into the eye and allows an observer to peer through the pupil providing a magnified image of the retina and its blood vessels as well as optic nerve. And the surface of the retina is the only place in the body where blood vessels can be viewed directly and examined for pathological changes. This is an important point. The surface of the retina is the only place in the body where blood vessels can be viewed directly and examined for pathological changes such as those that occur with hypertension, diabetes, cataracts and age-related macular disease. Several landmarks are visible through an ophthalmoscope. The optic disc. The first thing is optic disc. It is a site where optic nerve exits the eyeball. Optic disc is a site where optic nerve exits the eyeball. And bundled together with the optic nerve are the central retinal artery, a branch of the ophthalmic artery and the central retinal vein. The branches of the central retinal artery, they nourish the anterior surface of the retina. And the central retinal vein drains blood from retina through the optic disc. The retina consists of a pigmented layer and a neural layer. Pigmented layer is a sheet of melanin containing epithelial cells located between the choroid and the neural part of the retina. Melanin is the pigment, melanin in the pigmented layer of the retina as in the choroid also helps to absorb stay right layers. The next is the neural layer. Neural or sensory layer of the retina is a multi-layered outgrowth of the brain that processes visual data. Neural layer of the retina processes the visual data extensively before sending nerve impulses into axons that form the optic nerve. Neural layer is the place where visual data is processed before sending the nerve impulses. There are three distinct layers of retinal neurons. The first one is photoreceptor layer, the next is bipolar cell layer and finally ganglionic cell layer. And these layers are separated by two zones, outer and inner synaptic layers where synaptic contacts are made. Note that the light passes through the ganglionic and bipolar cell layers and both synaptic layers before it reaches the photoreceptor layer. And the two other types of cells present in the bipolar cell layer of the retina are horizontal cells and amacrine cells. These cells form laterally directed neural circuits that modify the signals being transmitted along the pathway from photoreceptors to bipolar cells to ganglionic cells. Now coming to photoreceptors. The photoreceptors are specialized cells that begin the process by which light rays are ultimately converted to nerve impulses. Photoreceptors are specialized cells that begin the process by which 
the light rays photo means light the light rays are ultimately converted to nerve impulses there are two types of photoreceptors rods and cones each retina has about 6 million cones and 120 million rods rods allow us to see in the dim light such as moonlight because rods do not provide color vision in the dim light we can only see black white and all shades of gray in between brighter lights stimulate cones which produce color vision and three types of cones are present in the retina blue cones green cones and red cones blue green and red cones blue cones which are sensitive to blue light green cones which are sensitive to green light and red cones which are sensitive to red light the color vision results from the stimulation of various combinations of these three types of cones and most of our experiences are mediated by cone system the loss of which produces legal blindness a person who loses rod vision mainly has the difficulty in dim light and thus should not drive at light night and from photoreceptors the information flows through the outer synaptic layer to bipolar cells and then from bipolar cells through the inner synaptic layer to ganglionic cells and the axons of ganglionic cells they extend posteriorly to the optic disc and exit the eyeball at the optic as the optic nerve the optic disc is also called as blind spot this is an important point optic disc is a point where optic nerve exits the eyeball that is an important point and optic disc is also called as blind spot because it contains no rods or cones we cannot see the images that strike the blind spot now coming to macula lutea macula means small flat spot lute means yellowish macula lutea is in the exact center of the posterior portion of the retina at the visual axis of the eye and the fibo centralis small depression in the central of the macula lutea contains only cones in addition the layers of bipolar and ganglionic cells which clatter the right to some extent do not cover the cones here and these layers are displaced to periphery of the fovea centralis as a result the fovea centralis is the area of highest visual acuity or resolution that is sharpness of the vision fovea centralis is the area of highest visual acuity or resolution now coming to lens behind the pupil and iris within the cavity of the eyeball is the lens within the cells of the lens proteins called crystallins they are arranged like layers of an onion make up the refractive media of the lens which normally is perfectly transparent and lacks blood vessels it is enclosed by a clean connective tissue capsule and held in position by encircling zonular fibers which attach to the ciliary process the lens help focus images on the retina to facilitate clear vision coming to interior of the eyeball lens divides the interior of the eyeball into two cavities the anterior cavity and vitreous chamber the anterior cavity is the space anterior to the lens it consists of two chambers anterior chamber and posterior chamber anterior cavity is the space anterior to the lens consists of two chambers anterior chamber that lies between the cornea and the iris and posterior chamber that lies behind the iris and in front of the zonular fibers and lens both chambers of the anterior cavity are filled with aqueous humor anterior chamber and posterior chamber are filled with aqueous humor a transparent watery fluid that nourishes the lens and cornea and aqueous humor continuously filters out 
blood capillaries in the ciliary process of the ciliary body and enters the posterior chamber. It then flows forward between the iris and the lens through the pupil and into the anterior chamber. From the anterior chamber, aqueous humor drains into the scleral venous sinus and then into the blood. Normally, aqueous humor is completely replaced about every 90 minutes and larger posterior cavity of the eyeball is the vitreous chamber which lies between the lens and the retina. Vitreous chamber, it lies between lens and the retina. Within the vitreous chamber is the vitreous body, a transparent jelly-like substance that holds the retina flush against the choroid, giving the retina an even surface for the reception of clear images. It occupies about four-fifths of the eyeball. Unlike the aqueous humor, vitreous body does not undergo constant replacement. It is formed during the embryonic life and consists mostly of water plus collagen fibers and hyaluronic acid. And the vitreous body also contains phagocytic cells that remove the debris, keeping this part of the eye clear for unobstructed vision. Occasionally, Collections of debris may cast a shadow on the retina and create an appearance of specks that dart in and out of the field of the vision. These vitreous floaters, which are more common in older individuals, are usually harmless and do not require treatment. The next is hyaloid canal. Hyaloid canal is a narrow canal that is inconspicuous in adults and runs through the vitreous body from the optic disc to the posterior aspect of the lens. In the fetus, it is occupied by hyaloid artery. Now coming to intraocular pressure. The pressure in the eye is called as intraocular pressure and is produced mainly by aqueous humor and it is partly by the vitreous body. Normally, it is about 16 mm Hg mercury. The intraocular pressure maintains the shape of the eyeball and prevents it from collapsing. Puncture wounds to the eyeball may cause loss of aqueous humor and the vitreous body. This in turn causes a decrease in the intraocular pressure and detached retina and sometimes causes blindness. Here you can see the entire picture of the eyeball. This is the light and this is the visual axis. This line is the visual axis. This is cornea. This is pupil. The colored portion is iris and below this is the lens. These are the zonula fibers. This one is the retina. And the white part is this clearer. Here is the hyaloid canal. And this is the optic nerve. And this part is the optic disc or blind spot. Optic disc is the part where optic nerve exits the eyeball. And this one is the fovea centralis. This is the place where I has highest visual acuity or sharpness. This is the fovea centralis. Next is this part is the choroid. And this is the aura serata. And here you can see This red part is the ciliary muscle and these are the ciliary processes. This is the anterior cavity which contains aqueous humor. In the anterior cavity, this is the anterior chamber and this is the posterior chamber. 
वॉचिंग प्लीज सब्सक्राइब फॉर फर्दर वीडियोज ऑन मेडिकल कोडिंग एंड सी पी सी ट्रेन